Hi and welcome back. I know it's been a little bit since I've done a boards prep video. If you didn't see, I was actually enjoying myself in North Carolina, but I have reluctantly returned to Michigan where it is a monsoon currently. And I got back on Saturday. I was able to finish the video. So for today's video, I'm going to be talking all about neurology and topics that you can expect to see, see on your state boards exam. I will discuss how to diagnose and manage in primary care, tremors, headaches, vertigo, dementia, delirium, Bell's palsy, and then just a few other key points that you'll need to know. At the end of the video, as always, I included a dump sheet to help supplement your studies. Don't forget to leave me any questions or comments that you guys might have, and please subscribe to this channel if you have found these videos helpful at all in your studying. And now on to neurology. Okay, so first up, I will be discussing tremors. So this, this is broken up into two categories, rest and action tremors. And it's gonna be up to us to be able to determine if it's a rest or action tremor, and it's really easy to do so. A rest tremor is a tremor that occurs on a body part when it is not being used or it's at rest. And then an action tremor, which is the largest group of tremors, um, this occurs when the body part that is currently being used has voluntary movement, muscle contraction, that is the, um, the location of the tremor. So that is an action versus a rest tremor. So an essential tremor, that is the most common neurologic cause for an action tremor. The incidence of essential tremor actually increases with age, though it does affect young patients as well. So there's a couple different um, onsets. So generally, it either occurs in the second year, uh, second decade of life, or the sixth decade of life. And up to 70% of these patients actually has a family history of essential tremors. So there's definitely a big familial component there. Symptoms of essential tremor are, include bilateral action tremor of the hands, absence of neuro symptoms or neuro deficits. They might experience tremors as well in additional places, though it's not required for diagnosis and it's less likely. But um, head or voice are two examples. Um, of where else the essential tremor could occur. Symptoms, they tend to improve with small amounts of alcohol. So that's just a defining characteristic. That's something that our, our patients might um, report when discussing their symptoms. So it's easy to see why a, a, a tremor could definitely impact a person's quality of life. And so there is some treatment options. So for mild or situational essential tremor, um, PRN propanolol seems to be effective. If they have more, um, more severe or debilitating tremors, then they may require a continuous medication therapy or continuous propanolol. Propanolol or propanolol plus primidone is also um, the combination therapy, according to the literature, is more effective in treating the severe debilitating essential tremor, though it is recommended that that be more, most, more closely monitored by neurology. So if you're having to step up the medication that much, then it's time to refer these patients to neuro. Um, this is because primidone has a lot of side effects, so it's just better to let them manage that. And then the issue with these drugs is though they are effective, after a patient uses them so much, they stop being effective as they built up that tolerance to the medication. And so they might actually require a quote unquote medication holiday or a break from the meds to bring that tolerance back down and then start back up so they can actually feel the therapeutic effect of the drug. All right, so Parkinson's disease is the most common cause for a rest tremor. And the typical age of onset for Parkinson disease is greater than 50 years old. It is more common in males than females. And the, term, the tremor typically affects hands, the legs, chin, and a patient's tongue. A pill rolling tremor is common in up to 80% of these patients. Usually it begins unilaterally initially and then um, it will progress to bilateral involvement. Associated symptoms, bradykinesia, which is a slow onset of movement. This is a presenting symptom in up to 80% of patients at onset. So they'll get up to go, um, like stand up and walk and it will just look like they're moving in slow motion, it's hard for them to get moving. The, um, the patient may have rigidity, postural instability, micrographia, which very small handwriting, shuffling gait with uh, cogwheel rigidity, decrease in facial movement, so everything becomes very rigid, very slow moving. These patients, key is 
identifying them and referring them to, of course, neurology. All right, so next up is headaches. And this is definitely an important topic because I'm sure you will see a couple questions on your boards about this. And I know for certain that you will see this in your practice. So it's divided into two categories, primary and secondary. Primary headaches include migraine, tension headaches, and cluster headaches. A secondary headache is where it's secondary to something else occurring, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in depth here shortly. But first, we're going to discuss primary headaches. So first up, migraine. It was originally thought that this was related to vasodilation occurring, but now research is saying that that is not the case and that it might actually be more related to neuron dysfunction. Still not completely clear as what the etiology of migraines are, but we can diagnose these clinically. And the symptoms that we're going to be looking for are five or more attacks that generally last anywhere between four and 72 hours long. And then at least two of the following symptoms are going to be present in these patients. They will have either unilateral pain, pulsating pain, um, moderate to severe in its intensity, and it has a crescendo equal, uh, quality, so it um, continues to worsen. And these headaches actually also worsen with activity. These patients typically like to be in a cold, dark room, away from light, away from sound, not able to function. And the headache is also associated with at least one of the following symptoms as well, either nausea and vomiting, photophobia, or phonophobia. So, and then also no other cause for the symptoms occurring. There's also something um, referred to as migraine with aura, and one in four patients with migraine have auras, and they may experience something like vision changes, which is the most common. Also, they can experience sensory alterations as well. And triggers for migraines, this is really important because this is something we can do to educate our patients and just life modifications that might improve their quality of life. So triggers for migraine, of course, we can't avoid stress all the time, but stress, poor sleep, changes in sleep, changes in weather, um, menstrual cycles, fasting, and then different things that we ingest, for example, nitrates, wine, aspartame, foods high in tyramine or potassium, straining of the eyes. These are all things that may trigger a migraine attack. And then um, important to note too is that children, they present um, potentially a bit different with migraine. They might actually come complaining with abdominal pain, have nausea, vomiting, paler, and this might actually be attributed to a migraine occurring. So something to be on the lookout with our pediatric population. So treatment for migraine, the first line is actually acetaminophen or NSAIDs. And key here is that we educate our patients that they treat at the first sign of any kind of symptom. You wanna stay ahead of the pain, but also we wanna educate on over-medication and overuse of these meds because it can actually cause something um, called rebound headaches, which is an, something we wanna be on the lookout for and what may actually, might actually be causing our patient to have such severe headaches is overuse of medication. So it's really important that we educate them to treat immediately, but also not to over-treat. So um, for, that's the first line. Now, if that is not effective, is that, if that's not working for our patients, there is a second line, and that um, is triptans. It's a true abortive agent. However, if triptans are used two or more times a month, then literature says we should start considering prophylactic agents. So prophylactic agents for migraine treatments include beta blockers, specifically propanolol, antidepressants, um, specific example is amitriptyline, and then anticonvulsants, specifically topiramate. And then below that, I reminded a few contraindications that are really important to these med classes. So for triptan meds, yes, they're really effective, but they, they cause vasoconstriction. And so therefore, they're gonna be contraindicated in our patients with ischemic heart disease, um, stroke, Prince metal angina, uncontrolled hypertension, and then pregnancy. All of those categories are a no-go with the triptans. Also, topiramate is contraindicated in a patient with history of kidney, uh, kidney stones. And then, of course, beta blockers, we know we can't use that in patients with bradycardia, COPD, or asthma, as it can cause bronchospasm, and we definitely don't want to do that to our patients. So just important key points there to remember when treating for migraines.
a tension headache. That is the most common type of headache. And the diagnosis of this is made clinically as well. It's bilateral, non-throbbing, sensation of tightness or a band-like pressure. Typically, these patients are able to function throughout their day. They might be uncomfortable, but they're able to carry on. The duration of symptoms vary between 30 minutes to seven days. And there are generally no associated symptoms no nausea, vomiting, photophobia, or phonophobia like you see with migraine. Treatment for these are also um, simple analgesics, so NSAIDs or acetaminophen. If the simple analgesics are not effective, then you can actually use caffeine as an adjunct, though of course there are gonna be some concerns there, so you'll just wanna make sure that your patient is okay to be using caffeine. Amitriptyline is, amitriptyline is preventative treatment for tension headaches. And other effective adjunct treatments I included here for you for reference more so, but physical therapy with cranial cervical exercises or osteopathic manipulation therapy are some alternatives if these med, cla if these med classes are not working for our patients. Something I guess to just keep in the box of tricks if the meds aren't working. <laughs> So cluster headache, this is also made, um, this diagnosis is also made clinically. It is always unilateral. Migraine is almost always unilateral, though it can be bilateral. Tension is bilateral. Cluster headache, always unilateral. It generally begins around the eye or the temple region. Pain peaks within minutes, it's explosive. It generally, generally lasts like 15 to 180 minutes. It tends to be episodic and it can occur up to eight times in a day for weeks at a time, and then they'll have periods of remission. The patient might also experience symptoms like rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, and eye redness. This is more common in men, and the, the risk generally declines with age. Initial treatment is going to be oxygen and triptans, and if you can't um, use triptans with your patient because of the contraindications we've discussed before, oxygen is a perfectly safe option. Alternative treatments include intranasal lidocaine. And then an example of preventative treatment for those patients that have chronic cluster headaches or remission intervals that last less than three months um, is something like verapamil, and that might help those patients with those chronic symptoms. All right, so secondary headaches, like I said previously, these are headaches that occur secondary to something else going on. A lot of these times, patients with these secondary headaches will buy themselves a ticket to get imaging. Like I said, the other ones, the primary headaches are clinically diagnosed, whereas secondary headaches, a lot of these are red flags and we want to get imaging. So. Red flags for these headaches are going to be a middle-aged adult or older um, that has a new first or worst headache. First or worst is a really um, bad sign, or it could be a bad sign, I guess I should say. The literature says generally they describe a middle-aged adult as 50 and older. However, this is not a hard rule, and some of the review courses that I referenced have said as young as 35. But I think um, intuitively it makes sense that if somebody comes into you 35, 40 years old, what have you, and they're telling you this is their first worst headache, never had anything like this before, it's horrible, I mean, you're going to do imaging because you want to make sure nothing serious is going on. It makes sense. So first or worst, that's a red flag. A thunderclap headache, um, that's where it comes on so suddenly, so fast, and it's horrible, excruciating headache as a thunderclap headache. Papilledema, you should never see swelling of the eye if they are, with their headaches. And this is... Um, concerned with a swelling of the optic disc. And this, of course, is an issue because it might be indicating increased cranial pressure. So if they have um, concurrent neuro symptoms, that is abnormal, atypical, that requires imaging. If the headache occurs with exertion, positional changes, sneezing, sexual intercourse, that requires um, further imaging, further workup. Systemic symptoms such as like fever or stiff neck, of course we're going to be thinking possibly meningitis. Test will of course be the Koenig or Brodzinski sign. And just important to note here, a little side note, the most common causing pathogen for meningitis is actually streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, if the headache occurs secondary to trauma, that requires imaging. And then other symptoms that might indicate a secondary headache, it only ever, the headache only ever occurs on one side every time, or this is referred to as quote unquote side locked. Um, that is a concerning symptom and that might 
um, that will warrant imaging. If they're experiencing impaired vision, seeing halos around lights, we might be concerned with uh, glaucoma that requires further workup. And then sudden and severe unilateral vision loss, of course, that's going to be concerning. We're thinking maybe optic neuritis. Or if the patient is unresponsive to treatment, then a further workup is also indicated. So when do we image? Like I just said, all of those red flags, if any of those things are present, then we want to do a further workup. Imaging is indicated because we want to make sure that nothing more serious obviously is going on. And the question is CT or MRI. So CT... I come from the ER, we did CTs like, you know, it was no thing. <laughs> you know, I know that's not reality in primary care, but of course CT, the pros to it is that you get really fast results. The downside to CT is you are loading your patients with tons and tons of radiation. So, and also really important to note here is if that, it, there is any chance of a leak or a bleed, possibly a hemorrhagic stroke, and there's no way of knowing until you get imaging, these patients cannot have contrast. An MRI is wonderful, but it takes longer for you to get results, and it looks at the soft tissue, doesn't have any radiation, so there's a lot of pros to it, but again, like I said, it's going to take longer for you to get your results, so not ideal in those um, emergent situations. Okay, so... Temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis as it's also referred to. This is, a, this is an emergency. And one or more of the following symptoms in patients 50 years and older could indicate this. So a new onset unilateral headache, abrupt vision changes, most commonly will be transient vision loss in the affected eye, jaw claudication, so difficulty chewing, painful chewing, elevated ESR and or CRP, and unexplained systemic symptoms, for example, fever. Also, the temple may be, appear um, reddened or indurated, and all of these are going to lead us to the diagnosis of temporal arteritis. So this actually requires an emergent temporal artery biopsy, and that is the gold standard for diagnosis of giant cell arteritis, and it also requires an urgent ophthalmic examination. And this is because we want to avoid our patient experiencing vision or permanent vision loss on the affected side. And so therefore, because of this, we don't even delay treatment for that biopsy. We initiate treatment immediately if we suspect that this is what's going on. And the treatment therapy is glucocorticoids. If the vision is still intact when the patient comes in with their complaint um, and glucocorticoid therapy is initiated, then the patient has less than 1% chance of vision loss. So that's why it's so important that we treat these patients early on. All right, so we're gonna change it up a bit and we're going to talk about vertigo. So vertigo causes the illusion of movement. Most commonly, patients will experiencing a sensation of spinning and it is always worsened with head movement. So nystagmus, this might be seen either at rest or if not at rest, then it can always be elicited with the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver. And we as providers, one of our key goals here is determining if the vertigo is peripheral or central in etiology. Determining if it's central or peripheral is really important for a few reasons. The most important, the most obvious is that central vertigo, this is related to an issue with the central nervous system, generally the brainstem or cerebellum. So obviously these aren't managed in primary care. We just need to be able to identify them and get them to where they need to go. Um, peripheral vertigo, this may be able to be managed in primary care depending. Generally there's only um, a sp one specific type of vertigo that you'll see most commonly and that you definitely can manage in primary care and that is BPPV or benign proximal positional vertigo. And this is the most common, like I said, type of peripheral vertigo. Other examples though include Meniere's disease and otitis media. Those can also be examples of the peripheral vertigo. And so how you determine if it is peripheral is by, having, by using visual fixation. So you have the patient stare at an object without losing their gaze for approximately one to two minutes to, uh, total. And this should improve their nystagmus. And if there's no improvement in their symptoms or nystagmus, this indicates that the vertigo is central in nature. Also with patients with peripheral vertigo, their walking is preserved. They might feel off balance, they might lean and you know, have difficulty, but they are still able to walk. 
Um, deafness or tinnitus, these symptoms actually may be present and there's no neuro symptoms, absence of neuro deficits, that is not what's going on here. It's not neurological in nature. So if it's central vertigo, so like I said, often involving the brainstem or the cerebellum, examples include ischemia of the brainstem or a cerebellar infarction or multiple sclerosis. Those are all examples of central vertigo. And with these patients, like I said, visual fix fixation doesn't improve their symptoms of the vertigo or the nystagmus. This does not improve. And they have severe instability. They're often completely unable to walk without falling. There's generally no deafness or tinnitus present because that's not what's going on. It's often more neuro symptoms that are gonna be present with these patients. So if those um, characteristics are involved, then we want to be referring them to neuro or potentially ER, depending on what's going on. Definitely not primary care. But those should be easy ways for you to define that myself included, in primary care, so we are able to take care of our patients appropriately. Okay, so like I said, BPPV is the most common cause for peripheral vertigo, and it's actually the most common cause for acute vertigo altogether. A clinical diagnosis is used here to diagnose PPV, BPPV, and the symptoms that we're looking for, it is reoccurrent and reproducible with the dix hall pike maneuver, and it is related to positional changes. Generally, generally, episodes of BPPV are less than one minute long. So that's how we're going to be able to determine um, if it is, in fact, the benign vertigo. Treatment for this includes antihistamines, including meclizine, dimenhydrinate, or diphenhydramine, also known as antivert, dramamine, Benadryl, all over-the-counter drugs that our patients can use for their um, benign premoc, you know what I'm saying. Um, also, the Epley maneuver is going to be useful in treating BPPV. And I put a link here. I know you're not going to probably be able to click on it on this YouTube channel, but when you, if you download the PDF of this, um, PowerPoint on the Facebook page and you'll be able to but basically you search Epley Maneuver in YouTube and you'll see it and it's a really useful tool for the patient these patients um, for correcting and addressing these symptoms of vertigo and there's actually some uh, modified versions of this that the patient can do on their own from at home. So epi episodes of vertigo that last minutes to like hours long this might be a symptom of migraine so just something to keep in mind for a differential. Also, like I previously mentioned, Meniere's disease is another example of peripheral vertigo. And I just briefly touched on it. There might be one very vague question, maybe even more so that you see like in some of your review tests that you do before taking boards. I don't know if it'll be on your boards or not. Um, but, and also it's just good to know again, if you're in, pra if you're in practice, these patients have severe episodic vertigo and it's accompanied with loss of hearing or tinnitus. So very severe symptoms, loss of hearing, we want, want to be thinking more along the lines of Meniere disease. And of course, we're not managing that. We're referring those patients to um, ENT. Okay, so we're changing it up again, this time to talk about dementia. So dementia is a gradual insidious decline in a person's cognitive function. Dementia with Lewy bodies is actually the most common type of degenerative de dementia in older adults. Um, often the cognitive dysfunction is going to be observed. Very rarely does a patient self-report having cognitive issues or issues with memory because they aren't picking up on it. However, however it's going to be family members or people close to the patient that are going to come in and mention that, hey, something is going on. Well, if that occurs, then a thorough eval is, of course, indicated also as a provider. You might pick up on these things as a gradual cognitive decline in your patients as they come in to see you. And then a more thorough eval is indicated as well. So remember with these patients, first thing would be an easy fix is to check their medications. If they're having any drug interactions or if any of their meds that they're taking might be eliciting these cognitive changes. Remember our older adults and elderly populations are very sensitive to meds. Um, there's lots of meds that can cause some cognitive changes. So first things first, check the meds because that can be an easy fix. Um, furthermore, if we are going through and we're evaluating our patients for possible dementia, there are some screenings that are very important. For one, a cognitive assessment. There's a couple examples. The mini mental state examination I feel is the most popular and I listed the criteria there. 
So um, mild dementia is a score of 23 to 80, 18, moderate is 18 to 10, and then severe is less than 10. A depression screening should also be done for our patients that we think might be having, experiencing dementia, as this can actually masquerade as dementia and also is a common side effect of dementia. So we really want to screen these patients. We can just um, do, of course, the PHQ-2, see how they answer those questions, and then see if it's warranted to do a further like PHQ-9. Um, also, we'll want to screen for B12 deficiency and hypothyroidism, as these might cause cognitive symptoms as well. And then also, when we're doing our initial evaluation with these patients, we should be considering doing something like an MRI or a CT to kind of get a baseline and see where our patients are are at. All right, so I also included the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for dementia. So it includes that there is a significant cognitive impairment in at least one of the following a, um, in learning and memory or language, executive function, complex attention, perceptual motor function, or social cognition. So there's a deficit in one of those areas. Typically, memory and language are the most commonly affected. There is an obvious decline from previous level of cognitive functioning. Their um, decline affects their everyday activities. It's not related to delirium or not related to any other mental disorder as well. And treatment is identifying these patients and referring them to a specialist as soon as possible. Um, I included some medications here for you that you might see that our, these patients are on just because you'll, we'll be taking care of patients that have dementia and are on these medications, but not because I think that you need to focus on them for your exam. So delirium is an acute change or disturbance in a patient's level of consciousness. Comparison to dementia where it was that gradual decline in cognitive function, delirium is an acute change. It's a clinical syndrome that might be caused by an underlying medical condition, for example, shock or dehydration, intoxication, withdrawal from a substance or an adverse side effect of a medication a patient is taking. For example, um, cholinergics or benzos can cause uh, symptoms of delirium. So these are all the things that may be causing this type of syndrome. And a patient can either be, they don't, they're not always agitated. They can be drowsy and lethargic and unresponsive versus they could also be the agitated, delusional, confused. Both of those are examples of delirium. And these patients, their symptoms typically worsen in the evening time. These patients require a very large workup. Um, I listed all the labs for you. Obviously, the treatment is going to involve whatever the diagnosis is. This is a delirium is a symptom of something else that's occurring. So these are going to be referred to the hospital. This is not managed in primary care. Just important that we know what to look for. All right, so moving on to Bell's palsy now. This is a facial nerve palsy, and it is of the seventh cranial nerve. And that's an important cranial nerve, I feel like, to tuck in your brain. It's possibly related to the activation or reactivation of the herpes simplex virus, though it's not 100% certain. Diagnosis of this is made clinically. It's an acute or sudden onset, typically over hours to 48 hours max, one-sided facial paralysis, and it reaches the maximum level of paralysis by three weeks or less, and then there's always some degree of recovery by six months. That is a clinical, that would, that would be how you'd make a clinical diagnosis for Bell's palsy. One big identifying factor is that a patient with Bell's palsy are unable, they cannot wrinkle their forehead. They cannot wrinkle their forehead. Um, and so I included this picture here. Um, it shows where the nerves are innervated and it goes up into the forehead. And for me, that just helped because, well, of course, it makes sense that if that facial nerve is affected, that all of those areas would be affected. And you can see how high up on the face it goes there. So um, Bell's palsy cannot wrinkle the forehead. There is a decreased nasal labial fold, inability to close the eye on the affected side, decreased production of tears on the affected side. All of these things can occur. They also might experience uh, loss of taste, though their skin sensation does remain intact. So when you're doing a facial movement examination, I listed the steps here because I just thought this was really helpful. Um, if, you're, if you're examining for Bell's palsy, these are the things that you'll be looking at. So you'll have the patient close their eyes, raise their eyebrows, frown, smile showing their teeth, pucker of their lips, and then tense of their neck. 
And those are the movements that you should have when examining for Bell's palsy. And also, of course, you're always going to want to do a very thorough neuro exam with these patients. Imaging, this is only warranted if a patient has any atypical symptoms, and this includes neuro symptoms or atypical physical symptoms. So if they're having you know, paralysis also in their hand or something on the same side, I mean, obviously that's an issue. Symptoms continue to progress and they worsen greater than three weeks. So remember when I said the clinical diagnosis, their maximum level of paralysis occurs at three weeks maximum. So if, there's, if their symptoms are still progressing, progressing and worsening, for longer than three weeks, that's a bad sign. Also, if there's no improvement by three or four months, um, that is also an indication to have imaging done. So the treatment for Bell's palsy is high dose oral glucocorticoids. And we wanna get this into our patients as soon as possible, preferably within three days of symptom onset. Antivirals, those can be used as adjunct therapy, but should be reserved for more severe cases. Remember I said that it's, um, assumed that it is related somehow to the herpes simplex virus. However, these are reserved for more severe cases. So examples of severe Bell's palsy would include a barely perceptible motion of the affected side of the face, asymmetry of the face at rest, incomplete closure of the eye, very slight movement of the mouth. So obviously just very affected by the paralysis. Then it's warranted to also use the antivirals. Another uh, point that's important here is protecting our patients from corneal injury. As I said, a lot of them will uh, have difficulty with closing of the eye or are not producing tears on that side. So we're, we're concerned with them injuring it. So eye protection should be educated to our patients like glasses, sunglasses, goggles, something to protect their eyes. Artificial eye drops, and those can be used hourly while awake. And then something even stronger for at night, some kind of ointment, um, eye patch at night. Generally, symptoms last three weeks to three months, though sometimes it can, they can be permanent. So cauda equina syndrome is rare, but if it's happening with your patient, you need to know what's going on because it's an emergency. So it's a rare complication of lumbar spinal stenosis. It affects the nerve roots from L1 to L5 and S1 to S5. And the patients will have an acute onset of saddle anesthesia, bladder incontinence, bladder retention, fecal incontinence, weakness or um, bilateral leg numbness. And it generally occurs as a result from an infection, disease, or a traumatic injury. And like I said, this is an emergency and it requires emergent MRI. So for this slide, cranial nerves, I kind of just included this information for completeness. Not that I think that you should kill yourself trying to memorize these. I think I maybe had one question on my board's exam that had a component of cranial nerves, but so obviously it's not something that you really need to stress out about. I personally do want to get better at this, so I hope I plan on doing like a video, maybe just going further into cranial nerves and coming up with tricks and ways to memorize them, but that's not what this is. I just included these here for your reference so you can look them over. One way I did remember though was for cranial nerve one and cranial nerve two, you probably have all heard it, but in case anyone hasn't, um, you have one nose and two eyes. Like I never forgot that. Um, five, I think it's probably good to know five, your trigeminal, your face, sensation and chewing. Seven, obviously, because that is a nerve that is affected um, with Bell's palsy. So that's just more for reference. You can look those over. You can find them in a million other places online. I also included on the side here, just because I thought this was really useful, was all the different like tests and what cranial nerve they're examining or testing. So I thought that was really useful as well. Neuropathy is a burning sensation or typically symmetric distal loss of sensation, weakness, and hyporeflexia. Hyperreflexia and increased tone actually typically more indicate CNS involvement, for example, disease of the spinal cord. So if a patient is coming in with these symptoms, it's going to be us to identify first if it's mononeuropathy or polyneuropathy. So example of mononeuropathy is our carpal tunnel syndrome, and we'll test with the Tonell or Phelan sign for that, and treatment for that includes wrist splinting at night, glucocorticoid injections, and then ac occupational therapy. Polyneuropathy, this affects the many peripheral nerves. 
most severely affected are the distal nerves. For example, we are always we've all taken care of patients with diabetic neuropathy. So contributing factors for neuropathy are hypothyroidism, diabetes, systemic anti-neoplastic agents, so like chemotherapy medications, alcohol abuse, HIV. Um, these can all contribute to a patient developing neuropathy. Also, there are other drugs that can cause toxic neuropathies. Though the risk is low, but it should be on our radar if our patient is experiencing these symptoms. So some common drugs include fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, nitrofurantoin, colchicine, amiodarone, phenytoin, pyridoxine, all of these, pretty common, can also cause, um, cause toxic neuropathy. So it's just something to have on the radar. Also, neuropathy can be idiopathic. So for these patients, we refer them, we identify and we refer to neuro, and we refer them even before doing any kind of lab work or anything like that because labs should actually be delayed, be delayed until they have electrodiagnostic testing done. So we identify and we refer to neuro. And then I did list some of the med classes here that we might see that they are taking for their neuropathy. All right, so last up is a summary of some autoimmune neurologic disorders that we need to be able to identify. First up being MS or multiple sclerosis. And this is an autoimmune disease of the spine and the brain. Peak incidence occurs between ages 15 and 45 years old. Distinctive episodes of relapse and remission and features are suggestive of MS if they include optic neuritis. This is pain and temporary vision loss. Laramite sign, this is an electric uh, shock sensation that occurs at the back of the neck and then radiates down the spine. Fatigue, sensation of pins and needles, and heat sensitivity. So all of these should be red flags and have we should then have MS on our differential. Um, diagnosis is made with MRI. Again, it's just important that we can identify and refer these patients Guillain-Barre syndrome, this is acute illness that might be triggered either by bacterial or viral infection. GBS typically causes rapid and progressive ascending paralysis, usually begins in the legs in about 90% of the patients. Typically, the weakness is symmetric and it progresses over about two weeks. Diagnosis requires uh, CSF analysis and electrodiagnostic studies. So if we're thinking this, these patients are obviously uh, going to the hospital. Um, myasthenia gravis, this is a disorder of neuromuscular transmission with a fluctuating degree of weakness in ocular, bulbar, so it can cause difficulty with talking, chewing, and swallowing. Limbs and respiratory muscles as well can be affected, and patients often have fluctuating skeletal muscle weakness and true muscle fatigue. Age of onset for females is typically in the second or third decade of life, whereas for males generally occurs in the sixth decade of life. And diagno diagnosis for myasthenia gravis includes serologic tests for autoantibodies and then electrophysiologic studies. So identify these patients and refer as well. Our key points here. All right, so this means I have reached the end of my discussion. That was a lot more, honestly, than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> As always, though, here is the dump sheet to help supplement your studying. It's completely dedicated to neuro, and it covers all of the points that you have to know for your board's exam and are very helpful for entry into practice. As always, leave me any comments or questions down below. Make sure that if you're on Facebook, you join the Facebook group, The New NP, because that's where I include all of the PDFs for my PowerPoints. I'll have the link in the description below. And then as always, don't forget to subscribe as well if these have been helpful for you in your studies. I really do appreciate the support and share with anyone that you think might benefit as well. And I will talk to you guys very soon. You guys take care. Mm -hmm.